Hi everyone, my name is Ricardo Stanos. I'm with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, uh, more precisely with the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation, where we make conservation superstars. Some of them are sitting here. Um, um, we've been hearing all along this, um, this wonderful summit um, a pattern, and we've seen um, the presence of young people and um, all our hopes uh, put in the next generation and the importance of the next generation. And we know that, um, in quoting Alex Degan, we are going uh, to, we need to tackle an exponential problem, right? And education has gone a long way when it comes to conservation education. And uh, in, as Alex said, we have to go from evolutionary to revolutionary. So, and we are well positioned to do that. Uh, we have learned a lot over the last um, decades. Uh, one of the things we have learned is that we need all types of conservation innovators. We not only need conservation scientists, we need conservation psychologists, conservation economists, farmers, carpenters. We need every body to be conservation-minded and to be um, in innovative, to create the next new thing. And the role of the educator is key. Um, we are swimming in data, but we are not swimming in wisdom. We have to go from data to wisdom. We have to go from knowledge to action, and that is not easy. Um, we have a very distinguished panel today, um, and we are going to learn about great models uh, that work out there and, uh, and uh, how they did it and how we can benefit from, from those models. The first uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Deborah Rowe. Uh, she's with the U.S. Partnership for Education uh, for Sustainable Development, and brace yourselves, She's going to tell you how you can fix climate change and empower others to join you. Deborah? Thank you. OK, great. Hi. So nobody can fix climate change. We are in for climate instability. But it is on a continuum about how much unnecessary human suffering there's going to be and how much species extinction. So let's stop worrying. Let's, no more time in despair, let's just get on with those solutions. So, if I keep pushing this, I will get to my slides, great. So here's the definition of education for sustainable development that came out of one of the international conferences. I want you to focus on that it enables people to develop the knowledge and skills to participate in decisions. That's decisions, that's active. It's not sitting around with armchair pontification. We don't need to graduate one more armchair pontificator out of higher ed or K-12. And what are we doing, of course, improving quality of life without damaging the planet for the future. And it's the same skills that you need that employers ask for. So those of you who are in a politically sensitive space and it's hard to talk about sustainable development, just talk about the skills that employers are looking for and what they want are people who can work effectively in teams, who can listen well, do conflict resolution, solve problems, and be change agents. There's really only two things we need to do to create a sustainable future, and they're in red. We need to apply the knowledge and skills we have to not just make individual change and stop feeling guilty about the ways you're not living sustainability. <clears throat> Guilt and blame is a waste of time. Celebrate what you are doing and move to systems change. Because we need to change the regulations, we need to change the culture, we need to change the policies. And if we do those things, then we'll get to more sustainable communities, sustainable economies. Of course, it's all within the context of our ecosystems. There's another level of this, which is if we just love each other beyond family and friends, then we actually will act out of the solutions for sustainable development. We formed the US Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development because the United Nations created a decade of education for sustainable development. And there wasn't going to be a US response from the government. 
Bush was in the White House at the time, and so a group of us, a very small group, got together. We're standing in the higher ed building in Washington, D.C., on DuPont Circle, and we're going, all these people have budgets and staff and gatekeepers for their CEOs, and they're not doing education for a sustainable future. We need to change that. So we made an organization, this U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. We had then a name of an organization, titles. We walked in, we got past the gatekeepers, and we used our two magic sentences. They work in a variety of settings, so you may want to write them down. You are in a unique and important position to help create a sustainable future. We can't imagine doing this without you. We're convening your colleagues to work on this. You would be missed. I hope you can make it. And they all showed up. You can find free buildings, you know, in Washington, D.C. that where you can host really nice meetings, and we did that. We ended up working with over 360 organizations, and we are in all these different sectors of society, as you see listed there. I don't have time today to talk about all of them. Much of our work are people who already have other jobs and do this on the top as pro bono. Many of them then work this into their paid career position. I could spend a whole other thing talking about careers and sustainability, but that's not my topic today. Ooh, we've got some formatting issues. So uh, that's a problem. You noticed that, right? So let me tell this to you because it's not on the slide. Aashe, A-A-S-H-E dot org slash Dans, D-A-N-S. If you go to aishi.org slash Dans, you'll see one of our higher education networks. It's made up of over 45 academic societies because we said, don't make people come to your event. Go to where they are. Where are the faculty? The faculty go to their disciplinary societies. So we went to their disciplinary societies and using students who helped us connect with the CEOs and presidents. Empower your students. There is no hierarchy. They have to learn how to make cold calls. We contacted them. We convened them. And now for over 10 years, we have 45 academic societies all working on integrating sustainability into curricula. We also got a FIPSI grant. We ended up with 13 STEM societies. Go look at the resources page here. It has all sorts of resources to get new faculty to educate about sustainability, to have learning activities, and to focus on the most important learning outcome, which has now made it into the international literature on sustainability learning outcomes, which is stop dooming and glooming, focus on solutions, and help students become systems thinkers who can be effective change agents. And the only way they'll do that is if you give them real world problems to work on while they're in school so they can practice. So I teach an energy management class, right? I have for 37 years. <clears throat> oh, I'm a professor of renewable energies too. And the energy management class, I could give them a fake building and they could do an energy audit and then I'd have a key. Uh-uh. I have them go out into the community they did an energy audit on the jail. They did an energy audit on parts of City Hall. They did an energy audit on senior citizen complexes, and they are transformed by what they have contributed and what they have learned. A little more work for me to correct it. It's worth it. So all of these academic societies are working on this. We also have a second network, which is the Higher Ed Association Sustainability Consortium, made up of the college and university presidents academic officers, student life, and the facilities and business side of the house. You can go back to any institution you're at and say, hey, go look at these organizations because they're saying we should be doing conservation and sustainable development, not only on our campuses, but in our communities. The most important project we've done in the last year is called Beyond Doom and Gloom, Engage Students in Solutions to Climate Change because there's way too many students that are getting depressed by what we're teaching them. Educators asked for it. They said, we know how to teach climate change. We don't know how to teach the solutions, particularly the energy-focused solutions. Practitioners asked for it. They said, we're so busy getting the solutions out there. We need students to help us to get good policy 
That's a systems change. That's a leverage point. Students have to learn how to find the leverage points and use them. And policymakers asked for it. They said, you know, we have all these utilities that are into fossil fuels that are dominating the conversations at the policy level. We're not hearing from the youth. So we created this, and we've shared it out. We had over 500 faculty on our first webinar, also 20 countries, and we didn't even market it internationally. Take a look. The impacts of climate change are already happening and becoming more intense. You've probably all heard the doom and gloom of what's to come. More droughts, extreme weather events, sea level rise, hunger, disease, and extinction of up to half of all species. The burning of fossil fuels is a big part of what's driving climate change. This is the conclusion of the vast majority of climate scientists. Unfortunately, many lawmakers don't understand the connection between climate change and our energy policy. Too many are supporting damaging policies that invest our tax dollars into harmful fossil fuels. With such a massive global issue, it's easy to be discouraged and overwhelmed and feel like there's nothing we can do to help. Well, there is something we can do. In fact, there's a whole lot we can do. Right now, we could be using renewable energy and better energy efficiency to supply as much as 80% of the electricity needs of the United States. Instead of just getting mad at the government, we can make it better. Those people in office are our elected officials. They're supposed to be speaking for us. But how can they speak for us on climate change if we don't make our voices heard? That's why we need to show up and fight for policies that support a rapid shift to a clean energy future. And look, even if you don't understand how humans are creating climate change, even if you don't care about climate change at all, there are still good reasons to support renewable energies. Clean energy would potentially be more affordable and more accessible to everyone. It would improve our environment and human health, and it would give us the freedom to make our own energy. And who doesn't love freedom? And if you think that you're just a student and nobody's gonna listen to you, you're so wrong. I've been contacting my representatives about fighting for a clean energy future. My peers and I started an organization on campus to foster the political will to combat climate change. I called policymakers and they listened. Now we have better policies that will expand solar energy. You should be confident using your voice. It does matter. Not sure where to start? Go to this website to get info about good energy policy, who to call, and what issues are being addressed. So that video takes you to information on how to sign up for policy alerts because it's happening right now. And if we don't get the students to show up and the public to show up, we end up with the fossil fuel companies running the future of our energy and climate instability is going to be out of control with terrible human suffering. So there's lots of materials there. You can go and get more information. I know for some of you it's like, oh, civic engagement in the classroom. But we have research that shows that it increases learning. We've learned how to handle all the concerns faculty have, so talk to us if you have concerns. Of course, it's in the context of this wonderful diagram on a safe and just space for humanity that I don't have time to talk about. But if you haven't seen this, go look for it. I also want to tell you about one of our other projects is a primer for presidents and boards of trustees and principals. If you need it, need it let us know it's free. We also have an international sustainability literacy test because too many colleges, you say one, I say two, because I see two. <laughs> the sustainability literacy test was formed because too many schools and universities are doing a poor job of teaching sustainability. It raises the bar. It's a learning test as well as an assessment test. It's in 55 countries, eight languages, four UN agencies, and all these international higher ed networks that support it. Go look, take it. If you don't like it, help us even improve the questions. It doesn't just look at our challenges for sustainability. It also looks at what are the skills to be an effective change agent. Last thing, community energy conversations. The Tea Party and the Sierra Club got together, created the Green Tea Party in Georgia, learned how to talk to each other, and found common ground so that we could get good energy policies. You heard about it in the plenary. It's time to ramp it up. Community energy conversations is a set of questions that helps them find common ground, civil discourse, less polarization, and exponential implementation of clean energy policies so that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's all I have time for today. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Lilly, uh, Dr. Jonathan Lilly from the, uh, he's the National Educator Education Coordinator for the National Sea Grant College. Um, and um, he is going to share with us how Sea Grant 
uh, is training future coastal and, uh, and ocean uh, leaders and how um, the program increases uh, ocean literacy. That's you. That's me. That's there you me go. Too. Thank you. Thank you. How many people here have heard of Sea Grant? Yes. Good. I can skip through some of the stuff then. So, as uh, Ricardo said, my name is Jonathan Lilly. I'm the education coordinator for the National Sea Grant College program. The mission of Sea Grant, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is to enhance the practical use and conservation of coastal marine and Great Lakes resources to create sustainable economy and environment. So really the key takeaway here is that we are looking at people and the environment. Given that about half the population in this country lives within 50 miles of the coast, 39% live within counties that actually border the coastline, you can't um, manage, you can't deal with the coastal environment without dealing with and managing with people. And Sea Grant really takes its uh, mission to, in, well, as enhancing the ecosystems um, in which we live, to also work with the communities to ensure they're sustainable uh, and resilient to change. Sea Grant is a federal private partnership. For those of you who don't know, we are housed within NOAA. Uh, administratively, a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. But really the bulk of the work that Sea Grant done is done through the state programs. So there are 33 programs. Every coastal county, every Great Lakes um, state, rather, has a Sea Grant program. They're all based usually at the flagship university in those states. And about 95% of the dollars that we receive from Congress go straight out to those programs. They work with the local communities. They work on issues which the states are focusing on, whether it's something in the Northwest, a fisheries issue or a Gulf issue or Great Lakes issue, whatever it is the specific issues that those states are focusing is what Sea Grant typically works on. So they're very engaged with the local communities. Um, they tie in together, they work well together. Many of the programs have regional groups. The Great Lakes programs, for example, all work together in the Great Lakes to manage that ecosystem and such. Sea Grant can be summed up essentially by a, a three-tiered approach. We have research, we have extension, and we have education, which is what I'll be talking about more today. Everything we do really is grounded in scientific research. About 40% typically of the uh, Sea Grant budgets that the state programs have go to research projects. They fund um, scientists, pr principal investigators from universities typically within those states um, to deal with issues, to address issues that the states are facing. So again, it's very focused on what is relevant for that Sea Grant program, and that's the research we fund. We have a national plan which uh, has a number of focus areas, which I can answer questions about later if you're interested. Um, and within that plan, the state programs themselves fit their own research goals in. But again, they have freedom to, to really focus on issues that affect them. So in terms of education, uh, we do two main areas, really, I'd say, in terms of, of looking and training the future leaders and conservation leaders. We have a whole bunch of scholarships and fellowships programs when we're looking to train the future workforce. And then we have a more general public education, informal, formal uh, outreach efforts that are targeted both at the K-12 school system and also lifelong learners, K through grey as we call it. In terms of the fellowships and scholarships, most of these are based within the state programs. We have about 44 in total. Um, so if you live within a, a, a Sea Grant state, which if you live on the coast, you probably do, um, and you are either undergraduate or graduate level, or you know folks at those levels who are interested in some kind of fellowship, then check out what the Sea Grant program has to offer. They have a mix of science fellowships for research, they have policy fellowships, they have some internships, a couple of states have uh, high school internships. Um, they vary from come and spend a year at the local state capital to work with policy makers, to funding to carry out some research um, to help you through your degree program. The states in blue here have undergraduate uh, scholarships and fellowships. The red uh, labeled states have graduate and the purple have both. Uh, and you can see pretty much just about all of the states uh, programs have some kind of fellowship. We have two national fellowships where we look to train leaders and future leaders who are interested in working at the national level. The first of them is focused on fisheries. It's a joint fellowship between Sea Grant and National Marine Fisheries Service, NIMPS. Um, there's two focus areas, one on population dynamics and one on marine resource economics. This is essentially a f scholarship which provides funding to PhD students working in these areas. There's typically about 10 or 12 or so are given out each year. Um, they get funding to conduct their research. They have symposiums throughout the year. 
and they get together, they present their research, and essentially it provides them with, with funding um, for the work they do. And then we have the Canal Marine Policy Fellowship, which is our flagship program. It's a national level program. Uh, it's been running since 1979, it's named after John Canals, who was instrumental in, in Sea Grant's establishment back in 1966. Each year, about 50, 40, 50, 60 graduate students, masters or PhDs, either recently graduated or in the process of graduating, ideally, come to DC. They get placed with a federal agency or they work on the Hill for a year. Uh, the federal agencies, NOAA, has a number of fellows each year, EPA, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Energy, uh, USGS, State Department. Uh, many NASA's had fellows in the past, and many of the fellows work in those agencies, they learn how the agencies work, they learn what it's like to work uh, in a federal agency, and they really get a taste for policy making. Policy students, policy students with a background in policy are, are certainly welcome to apply, but also it's really targeted at marine scientists, marine biologists, oceanographers, folks who haven't really had much of a policy experience and want to learn how they can translate what they've learned in the classroom, what they've learned in the lab and the field into policy. How can they take what they know? How can they take the science that they know and translate it into actual policy action that might be implemented. I was actually a fellow myself back in 2006, um, so I'm happy to speak more about the program, um, any questions about that. I know a number of our fellows have been volunteering at the summit today, which makes me very happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In terms of what else we do education-wise, um, again, most of the education activities that are undertaken by Sea Grant are taken at the state level. As I said, the vast majority of our, our money goes out straight to the states. And each state typically has either a dedicated education person or other folks in those states who split their time between extension and education work. And really, they do everything you can think of with uh, education, whether it's formal K through 12 lesson plans, um, going out into the classrooms and working with teachers to talk to the students about uh, science, about conservation issues. Maybe it's after school programs, uh, vacation programs. They have parent child programs. One program has a grandparents' university. It's bring your grandparents to university time. They do field visits. They do beach cleanups, river cleanups, uh, workshop science cafes, uh, laboratory work, vessel based education. If they have a, a boat, they can get out and use. So, really, they run the gamut of what they do. They focus on K through 12 undergraduate and graduate, and then lifelong learners too. So really anything education focused, there's probably some C grant program somewhere working on it. I want to give you a few snapshot examples. Obviously with 33 programs, there's a lot of activities that are going on. Just to give you a sense of the kind of work that's going on, um, I've picked out four examples to talk about in particular. Alaska C grant, uh, they have a, a curriculum they develop where they work with the Alaska uh, teachers, elementary teachers about Alaska seas and watersheds. Um, they took about 200 fourth and fifth grade students from Anchorage out where they were testing water quality, um, checking it for, for salmon, um, seeing how the water was, was good enough or bad enough for salmon, looking at local streams. In Yakutat, 125 students went out and had about an oyster farm. Again, getting kids out from the classroom into the field, working with the teachers, and giving them experience of the natural world that they maybe wouldn't get just from looking at books or listening to a, a teacher talk in the classroom. And then in Dillingham, there was a, uh, they celebrated Sea Week for the first time in 15 years, uh, again, where students got energized and excited about the ocean, the marine environment. And they worked with Alaska natives and, and other such. Uh, down in California, there is uh, the Ormond Beach Restoration Project has been going on there. Some of you may know about it if you're from that uh, part of the world. Uh, it's a 1,500-acre site that uh, used to be a great wetland and dune ecosystem. Over the years, it's been quite badly degraded um, for one reason or the other. There's 200 migratory birds would use that site. It's a, a great ecological resource. There's a very big uh, effort and a large push in Southern California to, to get this ecosystem restored to how it used to be, and Sea Grant is taking part of that process. They've, over the last five years, they've had 4,000 kids go out, um, taking them to field visits, training teachers in, in water quality monitoring. Again, getting these students, these kids, learning about the ecosystems, getting them out, getting them to see what the environment is outside the classroom. Many of these kids were from underserved communities, so they haven't had that much experience with the natural world, and getting them outside and getting them outdoors. 
Moving up to Georgia, Georgia used to have great oyster beds um, through disease, through pollution, through over-harvesting. The oysters have declined precipitously in Georgia. So Georgia Sea Grant is working with its partners down there to really try and restore the oyster reefs. They have a project with a catchy acronym, Georgia, um, which I'm... <laughs> Those of you who love acronyms, and in government we love acronyms, that's a good one, um, to come up with and essentially recycle used oyster shells. They bag them up and they create reefs with them. And the reefs then can then lead to more oysters forming on the reefs. They also provide um, defenses against the uh, coastal processes, erosion and such. They help shore up the, the, the coastline. Um, they have work with local communities, um, local uh, outreach groups, there's an education program through 12th through 5th grade, uh, again spanning the gamut from, from kids right through the local area in terms of working on the oysters in this case. And then lastly, Minnesota Sea Grant, uh, they have an issue that was identified with stormwater runoff, um, pollution getting in trash, litter, all getting into the runoff, getting into the streams and the rivers and the ecosystems there. So what Minnesota Sea Grant has done is partner with some folks up there to really uh, mount a public awareness campaign for stormwater runoff and what people can do about reducing the pollution and the impacts from stormwater. Um, they have a big, again, working with kids, working with adults, um, environmental literacy push out there. And they found that after about the last few years, there has been a noticeable increase in at least the awareness of stormwater and stormwater runoff, about 26% increase or so in the people who at least think they are somewhat responsible, at least partly, for runoff, which is at least the first start. Um, and they'll do more to try and either reduce the fertilizer use, the pesticide use, sweep up the salt and the sand they put down in the winter, try and keep all that stuff out of the storm drains in the first place. Um, compost leaves and grass and pick up pet waste, pet waste. So really working to try and change attitudes and also change behavior in this issue. And then just lastly, I'm just about out of time, just a few numbers to, to leave you with. Um, Seagrant educators typically read about 600,000 K through 12 students each year. We've supported about 2,000 graduate students. If you are a graduate student or if you're an undergrad student thinking about grad school, mm -hmm. you know, think about Sea Grant, think about the fellowships and the scholarships. We're happy to talk with any of you afterwards um, more specifically about those, um, especially the, the Canals program is a great one to get involved with if you're interested in working at the DC level. Um, and again, the state programs if you want to stay more in the state. Um, we have a bunch of thesis and dissertations in our library now from the students we've supported. And so, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was um, great. Uh, you may want to write down your questions for the end. We're going to have uh, questions and answers. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Daniel Sherrod. Uh, he's the provost of Earth University. If you don't know this uh, university, it's a university I wish I had <laughs> when uh, I was at that age. And um, he's going to um, discuss the need to combine agriculture with conservation and how education can help with that. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about, about agriculture, about education, and about conservation. And I, I dare say that most people at the summit, I hope not, but perhaps most people at the summit think that um, not only is agriculture not an ally in our efforts to promote conservation, but perhaps is the mortal enemy. Um, and I have to say in my many years in agriculture and many years in ag education, I, I sometimes feel the same way. Um, and, and this is why. Uh, it seems often that farmers, ranchers, and others who are involved in agriculture inhabit a, a different planet from those who are struggling to preserve the, to preserve the environment. And, uh, but, but when you think about it, the links between agriculture and conservation are not only many, but they're really strong. 30% of the, of the of the land area of the earth is devoted to agriculture, <clears throat> agricultural crops and pastures. Another 10 to 20% is in intense grazing. 
1.1 billion people, most of whom derive their living from agriculture, live in the most diverse, biologically diverse regions of the earth. So we need to, we need to feed over the next, I think the, the number's been recited here many times today, by, by 2050, it'll be nine billion of us eating. Worldwide, by that same date, we're gonna need to double agricultural production both to meet that increasing demand from the, the, the new folks on the planet, but also to eradicate the hunger that presently exists on the planet. So the challenge is can agriculture efficiently produce the food we need to do this at the same time meeting our environmental goals? Can we produce this food and still have productive soils, unpolluted air, sufficient clean water, um, conserved habitats, and biodiversity. But most of all, can this be done in a socially beneficial way? The, the dominant paradigm for agricultural development over the past few centuries has been agriculture against nature. The idea has been to tame nature, to struggle against nature, and ultimately to vanquish nature. And when you look at the development of particularly fossil fuel-based agriculture, it seems that agriculture won and, in fact, has vanquished nature. Over the last hundred years, we've altered ecosystems enormously um, through agricultural, agricultural development. But just as there are two sort of opposing Camps, environmentalists, and farmers, at least that's the dynamic we often see. I think in our own heads, we tend to divide agriculture from conservation. And what I'd like to suggest is that we need to think about new models. We need to think about a new model for agriculture, a new model for, for the environment. We need to integrate these two realms together and think about agriculture as being, in fact, the ultimate steward of the land. So we need, a, I think, and that's what, what that's going to take is a new generation of agriculturalists, of farmers, of agronomists, of scientists in the agricultural field. And frankly, higher education in agriculture ain't doing it today. We're still stuck in the same paradigm. I studied at Iowa State University. It's a great school. But when I went to school at Iowa State University, that paradigm of us against nature was very much the rule. And frankly, it hasn't, and that was a long time ago, it hasn't changed much. There's some changes around the fringes, but it really hasn't changed all that much. Okay, so we need a new model. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna talk about one small contribution to doing this, and it's, um, it's called Earth University. And you might say, well, this is in Costa Rica, and you don't say Earth in Costa Rica, you say Tierra. So why are we calling it Earth? Well, it's our name in Spanish, it's an acronym. It's the Escuela de Agricultura de la Región Tropical Húmeda, the Agricultural College for the Humid Tropical Region. This school was started in the late 80s by a group of visionary Costa Ricans who, based on the experience of Costa Rica in education, in 1949, Costa Rica abolished the army. They said, no more armies. Let's get rid of this. Let's take the money that we've been spending on the military and let's devote it to education. So based on that experience, these folks said, you know, we've got these terrible environmental problems. Well, look at Central America in the 1980s. Central America was the battleground of the Cold War. El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, uh, Panama. Costa Rica was kind of the exception. But they said, we got these terrible social, environmental problems. Costa Rica, for those of you who don't know, we all think of Costa Rica as that environmental Shangri-La down there on the Central American Isthmus. In the 70s, Costa Rica had the highest rate of deforestation in the world. That's changed enormously. Anyway, this group of 
really visionary people said, we need, why don't we create a new institution that's going to look at agriculture in a different way, that's going to look at agriculture in, through a lens of the environment and through a lens of, of, of human well-being. Uh, so it was essentially a new model, a new model that was going to teach these kids about science and technology, but also with a commitment to, to the environment, to rural development, and perhaps most importantly, with a really strong values-based approach to agricultural production and natural resource management. So the pedagogy that was designed for this institution is highly experiential and also extremely active participation on the, part, on the part of students, which others have alluded to, the importance. Let's get them out of the classroom. Let's get them in the field. Let's get them doing things, and let's get them working on real problems, not some made-up case study somewhere. Let's do it real problems. Um, I, I don't know if any of you shop at Whole Foods, but if you do, you can buy Earth Bananas. Uh, last year, we exported in 2016 one million boxes of bananas. And this is an important source of income to help provide scholarships for students. But more than that, it's a real world case of how do you produce a crop that's been, quite frankly, a miserable addition to the, to the, to the rural economy and to the environment of Central America. How do you produce it in a more sustainable way? So, so that's an example of real world problems there. Um, Earth's model is transformative. Uh, it requires students to challenge their beliefs. Um, it, it requires that students make that transition from learning based on rote memorization, which is the case in most parts of Latin America and Africa today, not to mention other parts of the world. Um, it, it requires students to, to, to begin learning based on discovery and active participation as, as opposed to just reading a book or listening to a lecture. But at the same time, students are working in communities. They spend one full day every week working with a small farmer on a local farm. They work with community organizations to develop economic activities in the community. Students with their peers develop enterprises on the, on the university campus. We lend them money. They develop businesses. They sell their products. They, um, they make a profit, ideally. But perhaps they lose money. But that's also a learning experience. Um, but we're challenging them to think of themselves not necessarily just as agronomists, but as rural entrepreneurs, as leaders, as stewards of the environment, and of, of the communities in which they live. Well, 27 years later, we now have 2,300 graduates around the world. We currently have 430 students from 43 different countries. Practically every country in Latin America, in South America and Central America, except Guyana and Suriname, um, from the Caribbean and from 16 African countries. Um, most of these students come from economically disadvantaged communities and from economically disadvantaged families. Fully 80% of them are on full scholarships at the university. So these are kids who otherwise would not have had an opportunity to, to study at the university level. Um, many graduates are currently um, building careers at the intersection of conservation and agricultural production. And I just want to really quickly introduce three of them. Um, this fellow here, Juan Carlos Ramirez, is from Honduras. His dream was to follow his father's footsteps and be a small farmer in Honduras. But based on his experience in Costa Rica, where he saw a country where 25% of the land is under protection, national parks, reserves, etc., he went back to Honduras and has spent the past 19 years developing the same sorts of programs that he saw in Costa Rica, working in the government and working in NGOs. He's worked in the, in the Rio Platano bios, biosphere. He's now monitoring 65 different um, micro cuencas, uh, small drainages, uh, watersheds, thank you, 
um, in, in the dry lands of Honduras. Um, th this woman, Fanny Omondi, is actually still a student. But before she came to Earth, she started with her family an organization to work with female farmers, with women farmers, in, in her village in Kenya to promote agroforestry. And since she's come to Earth, the organization has tripled the number of women with whom they're working. And she, as a remote member of this organization, provides uh, video conferences on uh, enterprise development and climate smart agriculture. She's an incredible young lady. And finally, this fellow, Norvin Goff, was the first uh, member of his um, ethnicity. He's a mosquito from Honduras. A mosquito in, uh, uh, member of the indigenous, and the first one in his vill uh, in his it's not a village, it's actually a small, uh, a larger town, to go to go to the university, and Norman when he went returned to Honduras, became president of an organization called Masta Mosquito, and they led a successful effort to title fully 11 percent of the land area of Honduras in 12 regional mosquito councils. And in doing so, now have the legal basis to prevent encroachment from, um, from colonists from other parts of Honduras, as well as timber companies. Now, the mosquito area of Honduras is a, is a land of incredible contrast. It's the richest biodiversity and the poorest people. And it's also now full of the drug cartels. So it's just, it's, it's a terrible situation, but they're doing, they now at least have the legal basis on which they can promote things like organic agriculture and, and community forestry. My time's over. Uh, if you're ever in Costa Rica, Earth University, come visit. We'd love to have you come. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, that was... I, I, I told you, you want to go to Earth. Um, <laughs> uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Amchat Edwards. He's with the US Forest Service. And he's going to share with us the factors they found uh, that influence uh, outreach and the tools they used um, to find that out. Thank you. They messed up giving me a mic. I'm just going to say that. OK? All right. <clears throat> I have no timekeeping. We're going to have fun. They gave me 45 minutes to do this. And I figured, since I work for a USDA, um, I should open up with an agriculture joke. But then I thought, no, that'd be corny. No, wait, wait, there's more. OK, all right. So. I work for the USDA Forest Service. Um, my name is M. Chad Edwards, education specialist. This is what I do all day long. I get to figure out how to communicate the messages of the Forest Service so that people will actually care and listen. All right? I'm not sure if you know it, but the US Forest Service is actually your secret BFF. And I'll tell you how. We've got 191 million acres of land all across our, our, our great nation that's doing great work for you. It's cleaning your drinking water before, you, before it gets to you. Uh, it's providing all sorts of ecosystem services, sequestering carbon and all that good stuff on our behalfs all day, every day. Your secret BFF, okay. Um, our mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands. Hold up, there's more. To meet the needs of present and future generations. So when I first came to the Forest Service, I was so excited. It's, because the future is in our mission statement. We get to work in posterity for the next generation, right? We've got firefighters, researchers, scientists. We have people whose entire job is to think about what is the health of this forest going to look like in 100 years? It's kind of awesome stuff, right? And, you know, cool people like me, you know, we do this kind of stuff. All right, so conservation education, we do. Um, this is really the, st uh, any good education leads to action or the ability to use that information, right? We all agree so far? Yeah. Okay. Now, 
the way that I look at this is we put on three hats in our, in, in our staff. We put on three hats. Anytime we have to do a presentation, create a product, do a program. We put on an educator hat, an entertainer hat, and a promoter hat. All right? So because uh, education, we have to share some kind of valuable, nutrient-dense uh, content. So even though I started off with really corny jokes, joke, jokes really corny jokes, there's going to be some nutritional content in there. Agriculture, see what I did there? Okay. All right. Um, and then entertainment, I've got to do it in some fun way so you'll keep listening. Otherwise, I turn into that womp, 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 right? We watch that every Thanksgiving. Um, and then promotion. If there has to be a solid call to action. There has to be. It's either uh, I want you to do something or, hey, come visit your secret BFF again. Right? Okay. So these are the three. I really want you to keep these, these hats in mind. And let's see. Um, the tools that we're going to show you, the way that we have come to our magic of overcoming these two great hurdles in any presentation, they are so what? And now what? I'm going to run through five programs, and I want you to constantly ask me, so what? And then once I've overcome that hurdle, you can go, now what? All right? Quick story. I was a watershed educator. In my neighborhood, I, I, a watershed educator for Washington, D.C. and the whole Chesapeake Bay area. I get home, and there's an elderly woman in my neighborhood who gets out of her car, she puts a couple things on top of the car. And then I watched her grab a bag of like food stuff she had finished with and just kind of threw it on the street. I know, I know, same response. I freaked out. So I go over there charging up. I've had a great day of doing watershed education. Kids and happy people learning about their connection to the river. And so I go up there with that same attitude. I'm going to talk to this woman. And she looked at me like I was crazy. I said, do you know if you... You, you, by, by throwing that on the ground, you just threw that in the river. Now, that's the messaging that I had been using all day at work because I was doing watershed education. But to the stranger in my neighborhood, she didn't get it. She looked at me like I was crazy and totally dismissed me. I, I was wrong for just barging up to her. I, I own that now. But what I came from that is, so what? She had no reason to listen to me, a stranger, and she's not, you can't see the river from my neighborhood. But everywhere you are, you're affected because we're all in watershed, right? You know how that works? Sweet. I knew this room was sharp. Okay. So I vow to never have that feeling ever again, ever again. So the next time I taught about um, the trash and it ends up in the watershed, I would start off with, how many of you kids in the room like to eat seafood and the crabs, right? A lot of, it's a big sense of pride in Maryland about the crabs. A lot of head nodding, right? Um, and so I go, well, you realize if you throw food on the ground, you're pretty much throwing it on your plate. Mm -hmm. So that was, so we, we carry this so what message. That's our initial hurdle. And then now what? So now that you have information, what can you do to, to do something about that? So here are the silver bullets. You ready? And I'm so glad that this is being echoed throughout other presentations. What I've done is boiled it down for you uh, Mama Bird pre-digested it. Okay? All right? All right, so, so what? The big things that make people listen, if you are talking about their money, we've got lots of uh, businesses coming on, CEOs are changing their companies to have greener practices. That's because they really cared about the environment, right? Well, I mean, they might, but unless it makes dollars and cents, he's laughing hard. So unless it makes dollars and cents, they're not going to do it. It wasn't until we changed the environmental messaging from save the polar bears to save some cash that people really began listening. Okay? So there's one. Talk about people's money. Also, their health. Right? Their health or their family's health. How many people in here know someone who has asthma? Right? So now that I've got a little bit of an emotional connection with you, are you going to listen if I start to talk about the ways that we can improve air quality? Right? OK. The doom and gloom doesn't work. Optimism does. Hint, hint, hint. Um, and then friends and peers. That is one that I'm not sure we utilize enough, but check this one out. Um, when MP3 players came on the market, 
the number one indicator on whether or not you were going to get one is whether or not your friends had one. You remember that moment? OK, I'm seeing a lot of it. Yes, all right, I picked the right, uh, the right examples for this group. Here, OK, all right, all right. So, so what? And then, you know, now what is, is a lot simpler. Um, if you can give people information that then leads to action, uh, lots of these presentations are having websites. Go to this to stay informed, stay in uh, communication. You can, uh, there's a, what can I do to take this message home with me? And then there's the great big make a deal thing. A lot of times in the environment, uh, that make a deal thing looks like um, community service hours for young people, or uh, if you plant this tree today with me, I'll let you come and eat some of the apples of it in three years when it actually fruits, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. OK. So do um, you remember, give me, give me our so what's. What are the hurdles? What helps us overcome the hurdles for so what? Somebody's money. All right, let's stop there for a second. We, <clears throat> we have a program that you can utilize right now. It's called iTree. Um, iTree is a tool that we put into anyone's hands. All you have to do is go to iTree. You can look up my tree. That's uh, uh, MCHOT's pet forest. There's a black locust there. I fill in one, two, three, four, five. I fill in six fields um, uh, about the type of tree, the size. And then what you're seeing on the right, let me utilize the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. All right, so what you're seeing on the right there, it actually spits out a dollar value of the ecosystem services provided by that tree. So you begin to overcome the hurdles of getting people to listen to you. You know, kids don't necessarily understand what a pound of carbon is, but they understand $20. Okay? Um, there have been school districts that have used this uh, that are using this uh, and to show how much uh, energy savings they're getting because all that's calculated for you. Uh, they were even able to save enough money uh, in one school to save two teachers because they were having to downsize, so they saved enough cash. Yeah, it's kind of awesome. It's a save a teacher program. Why not? <laughs> okay. iTree, free tool for you to use, uh, homeowners, everybody. The National Enquirer, notice I said the sixth grade PhD. We have lots of research in the Forest Service. We have great researchers. We have some cutting edge science. It's awesome. Now, those PhD level papers are great among PhDs. And then sometimes, how many of you are, are weekly reading those? How many? OK, I've got three hands. Sweet. Five, including. All right, sweet. So I've got five out of about 50. And that's cool. I'm glad, right? But for most of us, it's a little dry. So that pre-digested mama bird concept that I was talking about is what we do with our program called the Natural Inquirer. We take our Forest Service science and, and write it at a sixth grade reading level. So it can be utilized in a classroom. Uh, there are scientist cards that when you pull up the scientist card, how many people in here had heard of a silviculturalist before today? Sweet. How many people had heard of a, a marine scientist, marine biologist, right? Lots of hands going up. So this has over 100 cards that show different, different um, career options uh, for working in the outdoors. Please check it out. It's free. We can send them to your classroom, to your house, to you. They're, you can download them on PDF. They're awesome. This is how we get our message from the force to the people. We decided to stop fighting technology. We're mixing screen time and green time. We have a partnership with the American Recreation Coalition where we're utilizing a mobile gaming app called Discovery Agents. You can download it. We've got it on over 60 US Forest Service sites where rather than playing a video game where you go around collecting little monsters, you can learn about orienteering and then look up the blue spruce tree that you're looking at and then turn and face the direction where that blue spruce might have come from towards Colorado, all done through a game and augmented reality. Tons of fun to connect people to the outdoors, actually get them to engage. So we do our so what, and then our now what, really quickly, once you go outside and, and engage. FS Nature Live, another tool, absolutely free. These are like movies that you can sit down, grab a tub of popcorn and learn about climate or fresh water. We literally tell the story of water from the forest to the faucet. It's all there for you. Um, the number one hit uh, thing on there is lesson plans. Teachers are utilizing this. 
I'm using, utilizing it as a dad because it's kind of awesome. I watch it with my kid, and when he's done, he gets him and goes, I want to do something. So I know that it's good education, so it's education to action. And then finally, nature's nearby you. We're the Forest Service, but you know, we're not really self-serving. That's okay. I just want to connect you to nature. So if you go to discovertheforest.org, right on the page, boom, punch in your zip code, it'll let you know every single green space near you. Every single green space near you, not just Forest Service properties. And so the value and benefits of being outdoors, you've heard, we extol those all the time. Greater health, uh, relaxation, all that good stuff. It's there for you. How many people right now feel like you have the information and you could do something with those tools that I just gave you? Like, really, do you feel like you could do something with those tools? Sweet. My job's done? You all are awesome. Thank you. I not only feel uh, optimistic, I feel younger already. <laughs> um, our last uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Raquel Thomas. Uh, she's the Director of Resource Management and Training, training at the Iwakrama International Center for Rainforest Conservation in Guyana, South America. Ghana is in Africa. Don't mix them up because she gets mad. Um, well, in addition to this title, she's my dear friend. Uh, sorry if that's too much information for you, but um, she's going to share with us a really great program they have a developing local capacity building in, in for, for um, indigenous kids, um, combining Western uh, knowledge with a traditional knowledge. Okay, good afternoon everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, well, after that lineup, I don't know, I don't know if I could, um, if I, I hope I don't um, disappoint you. Investing in our future, and when I talk here, I talk about conservation. I love this photograph. I, I am a tropical forest ecologist, but I love plants. Here I was teaching um, a course on forest botany. And you know, he was learning to identify that plant just by looking at the leaves. There's a certain feature about it. Um, so I come from a place that has a lot of this. 85% 85 85 of our country is covered by tropical intact rainforest. It's beautiful. Um, so when we're talking about capacity building and, and uh, the place that I work, I'm going to tell you a little bit of, we're talking about sustainable management of resources. And when you're talking about sustainable management of resources, the core is about people. So how do we impact people? How do we build their capacity? How do we work with them to manage this environment? And where I work too, the people there have ownership of land. Um, we work with 20 indigenous communities that surround the area that I work, which is a protected area known as Ewokrama. There's one community that lies within the area. So yes, we're not Ghana, we're part of South America. I studied in the UK and people were always saying, oh yes, you're from Africa, that place. I said no. So you can see a lot of green, eight to five percent, as I told you before. We do have some beautiful savannas as well. Um, that area in white actually becomes a fantastic wetland area once a year with, um, when there's an annual flooding, when it's an, in the rainy season. And Guyana is part of a very unique place known as the Guyana Shield. It's a very old geological formation. And what happens is that it floods. When it floods, you have the Amazonian system merging with the Guyana Shield system. And it's very rich in biodiversity, especially for birds and fishes. So this Ewokrama forest is quite big. It's one million acres. It was a, play, a space that was offered to the international community known as the Commonwealth in 1989 by then President Hoyt, who is now deceased. And it was offered to be a space for sustainable use, to look at sus, uh, research and development in sustainable use and conservation of intact um, forest ecosystems, rainforest ecosystems. We're known as land of many waters. You see a lot of blue in that, in that photograph. Guyana. G-U-Y-A-N-A -A actually means land of many waters. 
So how the air is divided? How do we look at conservation and sustainable use? The air is divided into sustainable utilization area, the white bits, and the green bits is known as the wilderness preserve. That red line that you see there is a public access road that goes from the capital city all the way through to a town called Latam, which, which you can get to Brazil, Venezuela, and other parts of South America. Um, it's a very interesting setup. Um, if you know about the protected areas with the IUCN categories, it would be IUCN, CUN, category six. So we allow sustainable use. We do sustainable businesses as well. So we do capacity building, but we also do tourism. And we also have a forestry enterprise, which is FSC certified. So there are many aspects of it that also allow us to be a practical place to actually do capacity building and training as it relates to managing a wonderful area as this. So capacity building. I want to focus on two levels. And as I was saying, we work with 20 indigenous communities. Now communities, indigenous communities in Guyana, they own their land. They have what they call title, legally, legal title to their land. And where Iwakrama is situated, the communities are south of Iwakrama. There's one that lies with one community that lies within Iwakrama, known as Fairview Village. Um, now, for conservation to be ultimately successful, it lies in the hands of the people that live there. And their capacity must be built to, to, to manage the area. Not only though, because in our, what we've experienced in our training that is that learning is a two-way process, because we also learn a lot from them. And before you leave here, I really would like you to, to meet someone that is presenting in the next room is the Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs of Guyana. And he also is from this area. And he has been a mentor for me and somebody that I've learned a lot from in all the years that I've been working with Ewokrama. So this is a group of youngsters that are learning about co collaborative natural resource management. Um, we do a number of different types of training re related to protected areas management. But we start with kids from seven and all the way up, we work with adults as well. So we have a system known as the Wildlife Clubs and Ricardo Stanos, I'm giving more information. He's worked with us for many years, um, developing these young kids and working with them, giving them interesting programs to work with. And then we do other kinds of training as it relates to so tour guiding training, ranger training, collaborative natural resource management, et cetera. This was a group of rangers that we were training. Actually, this was a group of tour guides that we were training. They're from ver various communities, not just the 20 that we were working with. So we have trainers from all over. We have international trainers. We have University of Guyana trainers. You have like me. I'm, I'm a product of the University of Guyana, but I also trained internationally in the UK at a college called Imperial College. But very important as part of our training is to incorporate the indigenous experts. Indigenous people have been in Guyana for at least 12,000 years. It's their forest. The area we, we occupy, they use it. They know it better than us. And, and for, for our management and for us to be able to manage that protected area, we have relied exclusively, well not exclusively, we've relied a lot on their inputs to help us manage the area. So really, what we really sell is about traditional knowledge is very important to link with science for making the best decisions for management. This, this woman, her name is Paulette Alicock. She's amazing. She is a Makushi researcher. That's, that's indigenous people that we work with. We have nine tribal nations in Guyana. She, she's a farmer. She's an educator. She's a researcher. She's trans, transferring language to the youth in the villages and so on. So she, she is really a queen bee in the area. And Ricardo knows this very well. Some of the people we have trained, Lucy, she is the village leader of Fairview. This is when she trained. She was trained as a ranger at Ewokrama. Um, Nicholas, he is now a village leader in his village as well. Ron, this is the minister's son. He is now a top tour, uh, tour, birding tour guide, and he has his own business. He is also, see, he left Ewokrama as a senior ranger, um, and he's from one of the communities too nearby. And then you have the other level of training. I was a little slimmer then. That was a long time ago. <laughs> The other level of training is the, what we have at Ewokram is a young professionals training where we come into Ewokram and we work with a mentor. So when I just came back, yes, I came back with a PhD, 
But you know, you can have a PhD, but you still don't know a whole lot about practical management. So I worked with a mentor for many years. And the idea of that program for Guyana was that you come and you work in this, inter because Iwakrama is an international organization, because we are linked to the Commonwealth. But the idea was you work with a mentor, and then for two years, it was like a postdoc kind of situation. And what they were hoping is these local, local young Guyanese professionals would go and actually work in the national system. I was able to fulfill that. I went and I worked for four years with the Guyana Forestry Commission. But I love this place so much, Ewokrama. I came back in 2005. I've been there since. And there are other stories. There are many of us. This, this young woman, uh, Ricardo's also worked with. Um, you know the guy at the top? David Attenborough. <laughs> I know. Um, he is David Attenborough. She, she just finished her um, master's uh, at Cambridge University as well, but she's also a University of Ghana graduate, and she passed through Ewakram as a young professional as well. And she's en route, most probably, she just interviewed for the commissioner of the protected areas in Guyana. I really, she really deserves to get that position, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. And I, this is streaming live. I probably should not be saying this live. <laughs> so, so training on a local level and why we, we, we do have international input, if we are really going to truly conserve our forests in Guyana in the best way, it has to be homegrown. So home sown, homegrown. It has to come from us. And you know, I always say until the point, I am from the coast of Guyana. I'm not from the interior, but I'm in love with the interior. And I would like to see the day that my position is taken up by one of these young people from the area. And that's what we're working towards. So the student becomes the educator, not only for us, but also for, for persons coming from the outside world. This is a university, Miami University uh, master student, and she is learning from him. So I think, um, and he's now one of our Iwakrama Rangers as well. So that's it in a nutshell. We have many of these. It's a, it's a chance, not a promise to see it, but we have a very healthy population of jaguars in our area, along with many other species. Our websites are there. Um, thank you for listening, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you. All right. Um, well, thank you, Raquel. Um, I'm familiar with all this happening, and it's uh, there's, I'm sure, as with everybody else, uh, lots of stories to share, and uh, picking one to share in 12 minutes is always um, a, a challenge. So I would invite uh, our panelists to sit here in the front and take questions. We have two microphones. Any questions? Somebody wants to break the ice? Thank you. Um, I think this is primarily for the guy from USDA, um, but anyone who can answer it, feel free. Um, for some of your uh, now what things, one of them was this ability to take it home with you. And I was wondering how you overcome, I work in a science museum, and we try and educate about conservation and sustainability and um, better habits, and then we understand people leave the museum, go to lunch, go home, turn on the TV, and maybe forget some of the things they hoped they would do when they got home. Do you have any advice for how to overcome that? Are you keeping them engaged via social media? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it's my colleague who is in charge of social media. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of those programs that we had up there have social media, and we're getting over a million hits a week, but we're constantly reminding people to of these things, and if you ever uh, think that you're not doing enough, just know that little kids are like mosquitoes. They are constantly, you know, bugging us to remind us to recycle and to do all the things that you taught them at your nature center or science center. So just know it's working and it's happening. Thank you. One of the things we've done in K-12 is we give them a title. You are now energy ambassadors. You are now environmental ambassadors. You have a unique and important role to share this with others. And then give them a place where they can communicate back and build community. Thank you. Um, 
So thank you very much for all of you coming out here today. This is the session I've been most excited about for this entire summit. Um, wow, thank you. I thank you. work in a community of schools where I've had firsthand experience at a governor school working with high school juniors building a fluoride filter for a school in Kenya that will be implemented in the next two years. And I also have experience at schools that are two to three levels behind reading level that speak 64 different languages at home and have a real language and cultural barrier and are Title I schools with really low funding. So how do you bring these sorts of really high level conservation mindsets to both groups, the students who are obviously more than capable and the students that might need a little bit more of a push or might have other challenges to overcome that we're not as perceptive to? I live in Detroit. So we work with Detroit Public Schools. So go ahead and call EcoWorks there and ask to talk to the head of their energy, energy ambassadors program. But we did something with 9,000 youth one summer with Detroit Urban League. Um, at the community college level, we uh, in, it have them envision positive scenarios for the future of society and then use the concepts that they're using in class to tell the story of how we get from today to that positive future. Two things happen. All the scenarios are the same. There is an underlying common vision for humanity, for what we can be in the future. We discovered it over seven years of running this and then putting it on the ERIC database. The, other th the second thing is students who would normally flunk out, you know, they come, they come and their reading is bad and they flunk the test, they stopped. Um, leaving the class, and they stayed in class. We said, we didn't really say it this way, but basically we said, why are you still here? Because normally you're the ones who drop. And they said, it's this project where we get to envision the future and see our role in it. And then we said, well, can we take you to the Student Success Center and show you how to take tests, show you how to read more effectively? So it was the vision that hooked them first and then increased the retention and success. So, and we have that written up in a social studies journal if you want to see it, if you need that precedent. I have a question. So you're working, you're working with kids in Kenya? Kenya, you said? <clears throat> in uh, another country? Not directly. It's a oh, girls' okay. school in Kenya, and they recently had a well drilled, but the fluoride levels are nine times too high. Yeah. So we're working to develop filtration and storage systems to mitigate some of those. Yeah, problems. well, with our experience, when we, like, when we first went, when we first, um, Iwakrama was first developed, there was even no, no school in the village that we worked at. In fact, we built the first school. But the people had the knowledge. And um, from, for me, working with a lot of young people who may not have, the, may not have had the highest lit literacy level, they're also very bright. And, and I've had, I have done classes where I actually had to develop methods, like for some rangers, where I had to develop methods that it was linked to the fact that the students were not as literate as somebody coming out from university level high school. There are ways to do it. Um, but also, um, I think from like for in that scenario, you need to find some stars in your community. The, the traditional knowledge is a very powerful, powerful tool um, to use as well. So finding stars in the area that can help you. And there might be even be some young people who are educated from the community that can actually help you because you probably physically can't be there all the time. So that's, I would advise that as one method. You know, uh, speaking about different kids and with different abilities and different backgrounds, <clears throat> I think you just have to find what, what, what can they do. A at Earth, we do a lot of, the students do a lot of work outside. And we find this, we have a small, relative, relatively small percentage of students who come from much more privileged backgrounds. A and they do calculus. <laughs> and they do all this stuff, but give them a machete and they don't know which end to grab. So they grab the sharp end and cut their hand. Whereas a kid from a really resource poor, they've spent most of their life swinging a machete around, and they can teach these kids how to do it, and that's an empowering sort of situation. I mean, it's kind of, a, it's kind of an extreme example, but you know, kids from the inner city know how to do a lot of things that kids from the suburbs haven't the faintest idea how to do. And if you can utilize that, you're way ahead. Yeah. Also look at greening of Detroit and also look at taking um, junk materials, building solar collectors and putting up it, them up at the school and community centers and have the students run the projects. Yeah. Give them a list of possibilities. They add more than they pick the projects. You're creating change agents. Yeah. 
And I would just add, if you can get them out into the environment, the first-hand experience you know, does wonders. There's a lot of programs that Sea Grant has which they work with inner-city kids, underserved communities, getting them out into the resource. And I think when they see that firsthand, it certainly helps. Whatever level of understanding, whatever the reading level is, comprehension level, you know, seeing the actual resource itself it does wonders. Not a, not a question, just a quick comment on, on what they were saying as well. I um, help with an ESL learning class in my senior year of high school, and uh, one of the teachers was an English teacher, but she was working on doing poetry with the kids. So finding creative outlets for students who have low literacy rates, they're extremely creative, and because of the environments that they've grown up in, usually really great at using yeah. low resources yeah. to create really amazing things. So sorry, just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> More questions. This is your chance. I just want to thank you all for donating your lives to the earth. And and uh, I, I think that the things you guys discussed is understood at an elementary level as human beings. And I'd like to um, just pray that every person on earth is educated with this information because it's not very complicated, it's very simple. And uh, I love that um, tree, I tree, where, it, you know, I, money to me is not important, but I understand we live in a capitalist country where our president cares most about money, so that's why we elected him. But as things change and he gets impeached, um, <laughs> and I become president in 2020, I want to let you all know that I greatly appreciate everything you're doing and that education is number one and I just appreciate you guys educating us because um, our children are the future and, and everything that you explained today has greatly enriched me as a person, so thank you. Thank you. Well, we had the official launch of the 2020 campaign. This is the first one, so we need to... <laughs> Joey Herman, 2020. <laughs> Any additional questions? This is a, an exceptional panel, and I want to give you guys every opportunity to ask them questions. Um, hi, thank you again for everything. Um, I have a question about communicating and educating our peers. Um, I have uh, have a lot of experience in informal science education, and also some in research, and I've come across this problem where many of my family or friends who are not in science, mm -hmm. they don't even, like I just try to even start bridging the topic, and they just assume that they won't be able to understand. And they just kind of shut down. And I think that's a big problem politically, um, and in our communities and why there's some kinds of disconnect as well as just lacking experience of getting outside and so on and so forth. But how, how do you guys tackle that kind of building that bridge just even from the beginning? I talk to everybody like they're kids. I mean, literally, I got to do and uh, I got to teach two past presidents about the importance of riparian buffer zones. And I treated them just like my high school kids. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll say is, if you're struggling, one of those resources sources was the Natural Enquirer. It breaks things down in a way that keeps kids, in, keeps kids entertained and keeps them informed. And so if you can try using some of that, I mean, I, I learned to speak Spanish by picking up children's books in Spanish. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can learn it as a kid, you can, it, you can apply it. Um, Taking people to actually show them and touch the resource is great. I'm not trying to turn this into a commercial, but right now I smell like campfire from a place within 15 miles of my home in Washington, D.C. I live in the city, but I smell like campfire from last night. Punch in the zip code and you're in that uh, discover the forest and take somebody somewhere and actually show them so they can put their hands on it, let them engage, watch, their, watch them blossom. Talk to them like kids. So before I did all this, I worked for a solar energy company and then I owned a solar energy company. Don't be afraid to learn about persuasion because persuasion is really about holding people's hands and listening first and understanding what they care about and supporting them through their um, growth process. 
Um, but you need to find out what's shutting them down. Also, your family and friends are the last ones you're going to be able to talk to. Like, learn how to talk to everybody else first, you know? I mean, after 20 years, my mom calls yes. up and says, Debbie, I just read in the New Yorker about climate change. You have to fix this. It's like, Mom, what do you think I've been doing the last 20 years? So I, I would worry less about them. And I would also go to this Living Room Conversations website because it has a whole bunch of ways of asking questions that opens things up instead of making them wrong and shutting them down. And I, I have 37 years of teaching a bunch of heating and cooling guys and auto company guys who like they have all their these defensive and resistances. So if you want more specifics, I'm glad to share. Yeah, love them as you, as you share with them. Hi everyone, thank you so much for your presentations. This question is for Raquel. Um, about traditional wisdom, it's so important, and I do recognize the importance of incorporating that into sustainability education. Now, for someone like me, for example, um, who has received Western training, and I haven't learned directly from indigenous people, and I want to learn more than I can read from books, how can I get that knowledge? Do I have to go into the rainforest? And I don't necessarily want to be a tourist, or to kind of invade their space. So what are your recommendations? Well, I was just like you. <laughs> when I started working at Ewokrama, I had to, as you say, open up myself to listen. And that's how I learned. And they're amazing people. I, first of all, Guyana is a good place to come visit because our indigenous people speak English. <laughs> we speak English, so it's easy. Um, but yes, they were my teachers. Of course, I had other professionals, Guyanese professionals that worked with me, and international persons. And we all worked together, and it, it, it does call for a lot of listening. And not going in there with an attitude, oh yes, I have a PhD, um, call me Dr. This, and you know, I know everything, and so on. I teach forest botany, forest dendrology, all sorts of things, forestry and so on. But I have learned more, I've learned so much from my indigenous students, especially, because they learn from their parents and grandfathers. And so, so they come into my class already educated about the forest. So you have to be also open, open to, to, to that. But you can do it right here. They're, 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 I'm sure they're, they're communities that have certain expertise, and they may not even be indigenous. They may be you know, other you know, people that surround you every day. But when you start speaking to people, and you realize, oh, they know about that river and what's in that river and the history of this building, you know, those sorts of things. It just opens you up and respecting everyone. The old is very good to interact with old people. I love working with young people. I, I was talking to the, the tree group, the rapper guy. The, oh, I, I, I took a selfie, but they took the selfie with me. But I love engaging youth. And you know what? Youth need mentorship. Youth need us. They're the future. And we have to help to guide them because sometimes our youth can get lost. But they know a lot. There's some fantastic young as you've seen here. You're one. <laughs> she has a Caribbean background too. <laughs> so uh, I know, but you you know, we all young. <laughs> At the end of the day. I don't know if you wanna yeah? Okay. Any additional questions? Mr. President. So what can we all do on a daily basis to help conserve the earth in terms of uh, we're all consumers, we're all living in a structure that's kind of set up. What, what can we all do on a daily basis like from anything, like starting simple, what can we all do as a, as a unit, as, as a group to help conserve the earth like what can I do right now what choices can I make right now as a person that will help the earth in terms of anything thank you use your force multipliers which are your friends and by taking somebody and teaching them because you can't change the world by yourself it's gonna take you organizing masses of people to get you elected right <laughs> You can't do that by yourself. So education is the biggest thing. Show everybody around you, teach them. So once you figure out that one thing, and then if you're already good, just do better and better every single day. Okay. 
Thank you all um, for coming and let's give our panel a big round of applause.